marhaban wa ahlan bukum fi baranamij dakhil Washington. Ma'akum mudifakum, Robert Satloff. Kabla mi attain wa sitin amen, ja'a morake baritani bimustalakh jadid le wasf mustafmir itakhada kararat khata'a wa ajza an tasdid duyunihi. Thum mundu haweli niat am, in takala el mustalakh min el kata el mali il el siyasa. Wadelika le wasp el siyasi, eledi yachtil munseb munseban, walekin le sulta le dehi. Washarafa wat mansibihi al el intaha. Il an yumkin an yushir hadil mustalakh il el congress el ameriki pe akmilihi, chalel hadihil fatra el gariba, badil intahabet. Well, I can cobble on Yatawalla and Morashuhun of Fa'izun, Mana Sibuhu, El Mustalach, Hua, Bata, Arja. Ya Takid Badness on El Congress, Ayel Bata El Arja, Hua, Madia, Lil Wakat. Feel Wakia, Yumkin on Yakun, El Ox, Sahihan. Fahadan, El Shaharan, Kad Yakune. El Akhtar Fatra Fa'liya Bil Nisba Illa Eye Congress. La Kad Akarra El Congress El Hali Kanunan Tarikian Min Kawenin El Hukuka Madania. Heithu Ata El Shariya Le Zuwaj El Mathaliyin. Inuhu Tashriya Lem Yokun Mumkinan Kabla Lintahabet. Wahunek El Kathir Menel Amel Yajibel Kiyam Bihi. Kabla an yabda a'da majlis al-shuyukh wal nawab al-judud wa dha ifahim. Lumunakasha ayyam had al-Congress al-akhira wa ayyam iftitah al-Congress al-jadid. Yo Sidney anu rahim bifariq min al-khubara al-siyasiyin al-barizin. Jessica Taylor with Steve Clemens with David Hawkins. Welcome back to Dachl, Washington. We're getting close to the end of the year. 2022, and there's still a lot of politics to be done. Even weeks after our midterm election, uh, we are sorting out who's who on Capitol Hill and the relationship between Capitol Hill and the White House. I'm delighted to welcome Jessica Taylor, Steve Clemens, and David Hawkins to help explain all of this to you, our Middle East viewers. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. So um, some minor shuffling in the slim Democratic majority in the Senate. Let's help explain what happened. First, victory for the Democrats in Georgia. Jessica, how did that happen and what does it mean? Well, it means for right now, at least, that Democrats are going to have a, one more seat cushion than they had last year. So they were still in power, of course, winning that back after 2020 and two Georgia runoffs that were critical in that. So while the Georgia runoff this time, we knew Senate control was already decided. It gives them a one seat majority. And this was a, you know, one of the most expensive races there between Raphael Warnock, who was running for a full time, full term this time after having won that special election that gave Democrats control two years ago. He was running against Herschel Walker, who was a former University of Georgia football star running back. He won the Heisman Trophy, played in the NFL. Um, you know, and but it turns out he was a really bad candidate with a lot of baggage. And we saw that in on election night back in November when every single every single statewide Republican led by Brian Kemp at the top of the ticket um, won their race outright and with a with a majority and didn't have to go to a runoff, whereas Walker was uh, trailed camp by about 200,000 votes. And, you know, he really had to get to sort of woo some of those voters back to his side. Um, Republicans that may have voted for Kemp and then Warnock, but that clearly didn't happen. I think there were still, you know, concerns about his personal life, um, his business dealings, just a lot of questions. And he'd go on these very strange rants on the campaign trail, one um, closing one about vampires and werewolves. And ultimately, just a lot of voters did not see him as prepared to be in the Senate. And I think this just underscores the problem that Republicans had across the board and what was a very, what again, they should have been able to flip one seat given the history and given where we saw President Biden's numbers and the economy and different things. So if the Republic, if the Democrats gained a seat 
um, in Georgia, Steve, suddenly they lost a seat when when a, um, a certain senator decided to go independent. Who is that and why does that matter? Well, that's Senator Kirsten Sinema of Arizona, and she um, has decided for a number of reasons, which I think are important, to become an independent. She's still going to caucus with the Democrats. Senator uh, Chuck Schumer, the, the Senate Majority Leader, um, has said that she will continue to get all the uh, positions she had previously, even though she's left the Democratic Party. Uh, she's not going to run in the Democratic primary process uh, in Arizona, but she will keep her committee assignments. So as far as what Jessica just shared, the numbers and the majority, that one seat breathing room that Joe Biden got after this election in the Senate will remain uh, with her decision. What's more interesting in some ways is what's going on inside the Democratic Party inside Arizona. I think Kirsten Cinema is not popular with um, all of the Democrats in Arizona, the voters, and she's beginning to look at the possibility and probability that will be she will be challenged uh, by other Democrats, particularly Congressman Ruben Gallego. Um, so she quit the Democrats, probably suspecting that she would lose uh, an upcoming primary in that state. And now the Democrats have a real problem because if she runs in the next primary or next race, and the Democrats put someone up. They'll split a ticket and it will make it easier for Republicans to potentially win in Arizona. So she, her move uh, is one that right now doesn't change the vote count in the Senate, but it certainly makes the, the politics for the Democrats in Arizona, which is a key state for them, very complicated in the future. So this is a lot of uh, what we'll call inside Senate baseball. Um, David, when you look at the, the big picture um, uh, of where Congress ends up, Senate, House, where Congress ends up at the end of 2022, um, now that we finally have tallied all the major votes, what's the balance? So right in the end, the balance, so, so the old Congress comes to an end at the end of 2022, New people who were elected in November take office in early January. We have a, a return of divided Congress uh, for the first time in several years. The, the House of Representatives elected district by district around the country, 435 seats. The Republicans now control it with just four seats to spare. They have, they'll have about 222 seats out of 435. On the other side of the Capitol, the Senate, two senators from every state, uh, 51, essentially 51 Democrats, 49 Republicans. So, and then, so divided Congress, uh, Joe Biden in the White House, a Democrat. Um, I think we now, uh, probably the three of us can agree uh, that we're looking forward to two years of not a lot of legislating, not a lot of deal making. Uh, the presidential uh, election of 2024 has already started. Even before we have this shift in January from uh, Democratic to Republican control in the House, we've seen a little glimpse of uh, of surprising bipartisanship in the in the waning days of 2022. Steve, what is the Respect for Marriage Act, and why does that matter? How is it possible that an overwhelming majority uh, with lots of Republicans, not not all the Republicans, but quite a few signed up for what would have been normally a controversial piece of legislation. Well, I mean, this is a really uh, important uh, point is that right now the United States Constitution and the Supreme Court have ruled that uh, that marriages are legal and have to be respected throughout the land in same sex marriages. And this is a this is a fundamental right embedded in this, you know, that the Supreme Court has decided. However, in the decision to overturn abortion, to overturn abortion rights uh, of women uh, called Roe v. Wade, it's called the Dobbs decision. Um, Clarence Thomas, an associate justice at the Supreme Court, said not only uh, is this decision one that we want to overturn, but there's a line of other decisions <clears throat> that we might want to go back and review, including uh, protections for marriages in the in uh, of those of same sex, and so that the, this basically brought to action a question that we need legislation to protect marriages that are already in place, same-sex marriages. And this, this doesn't completely mirror, I just want to be honest, doesn't completely mirror the Supreme Court protections, but it was you know, basically saluted as a major step in creating the legal protections for same-sex marriage. Nationally in the United States, well over 70% of Americans have absolutely you know, absolutely support and embrace same-sex marriage. And that goes for both political parties, essentially. But in some states, 
There are Republicans. We still had a majority of senators and a majority of Republican House members that still voted against this provision because the people in their base, very much the evangelical Christian base, still has a problem with same-sex marriage and creates a challenge for them. But I think that uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, who voted against this, nonetheless wanted this issue to go away. He wanted it to be dealt with. He never wants to bring up as he looks at it as settled business that only causes trouble for the Republican caucus, not much opportunity. So that's my take on it. So, but uh, Jessica, if there are enough Republicans to help achieve this bipartisan vote, are there enough Republicans to do other business? On social issues, 70% of Americans support some form of abortion rights. Um, is, there, um, uh, is there a vote um, to be had on that? Well, I think when it comes to abortion, I mean, the question is, how long do you allow it for? What are the protections? We've clearly seen, you know, uh, I mean, Lindsey Graham proposed a 15-week ban um, at a time when Republicans did not want to be talking about uh, the abortion issue after Dobbs either, um, because uh, it, uh, you know, they would initially said this sends the decision back to the states, but instead Graham was stepping in there and saying, well, this is a federal vote. And I, I think that, you know, same-sex marriage isn't as nuanced. It's either, you know, can they get married or can can they not? And I would also note this protects interracial marriage as well, which was decided by the Supreme Court even before that uh, in Loving v. Virginia. All right, we'll come back um, after the break, continuing this conversation and ask a somewhat conspiratorial question. Do the Democrats secretly really want Donald Trump to be the candidate, given how poorly his chosen nominees did in November? We'll get at this with our guests in just a moment. The baton is passing in the U.S. House of Representatives with a narrow Democratic majority giving way to a narrow Republican majority. We have come to the end of the remarkable career of Nancy Pelosi, twice Speaker of the House and the first woman ever to hold what is constitutionally second in line of succession after the vice president. In her place, we are likely, though not definitely, we are likely to see Kevin McCarthy of California, the current Republican leader, whose goal is to avoid the fate of recent Republican speakers like John Boehner and Paul Ryan, whose leadership was undone at least as much by insurrection and infighting within their own party as by larger trends in national politics. Who will the next speaker hope to emulate? Let's take a moment and look at three of the most successful speakers in history, men who strode like Colossus through Washington, but names that are largely forgotten today. Joseph Cannon, Republican of Illinois, who served as the 40th Speaker of the House under Presidents Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft. Cannon exercised exceptional control during his speakership earning him the nickname Czar Cannon. In a harbinger of things to come, his tight grip on the House lasted until a political revolt, led by a small sect of Republicans curbing his power. And then there's Sam Rayburn, Democrat of Texas, who served three separate times as Speaker under Presidents Dwight David Eisenhower and John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Rayburn holds the record as the longest serving speaker, a position that he held 17 years. Considered a master negotiator, Rayburn is credited with raising the prominence of his party during his speakership and supporting the budding career of Lyndon B. Johnson, eventually president himself. And then there's Thomas P. Tip O'Neill Jr., Democrat of Massachusetts, the 55th speaker, who served under Presidents Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, and most famously, Ronald Reagan, the ideological conservative with whom the New England liberal built an unusual friendship and even partnership, keeping his principles strong, but still reaching agreement across the aisle, especially on how to work together to fight the Cold War, even with the president who viewed the world so differently. Will the new speaker have the iron grip of cannon, the political smarts of Rayburn, 
or the genial bipartisanship of O'Neill? Or will he chart his own path? Will he control his party's extremes or will he be captured by them? Answers to these questions will determine if future generations remember the name Kevin McCarthy or whoever it is comes out on top in the Republican leadership contest. Our guests again today include Jessica Taylor. Jessica is the Senate and Governor's Editor for the Cook Political Report with Amy Walter, and she's senior author of the 2022 edition of the Almanac of American Politics. Previously, she was political reporter for National Public Radio and NBC News. Also joining us is Steve Clemens. Steve is the founding editor-at-large for Semaphore a new international news site. Previously, Steve was at The Hill, The Atlantic, New America Foundation, and the Nixon Center for Peace and Freedom. And joining us from his home in Philadelphia, birthplace of American democracy, is David Hawkins, senior editor of The American Leader, a nonprofit taking on America's biggest systemic problems. He was also founding editor of thefulcrum.com, and he spent two decades as senior editor at CQ and Roll Call, two must-read news sites covering Capitol Hill. Well, Jessica, what do you think? Do you think the Democrats secretly want to inflate Donald Trump because perhaps he's the best opponent that they could face in 2024? Well, there were a lot of people that thought that in 2016 as well, and we saw what happened. So I don't think you can underestimate him. And just even looking at 2020, really, this came down to just, you know, a handful of thousands of uh, tens of thousands of votes in the most critical battleground states. So you I mean, I, I just think I don't think that's smart if they are and, I, and Democrats I talk to are, are not doing that. Um, <laughs> I think you can't underestimate him. And what we have seen with the, you know, endorsements that he made, that popularity he has and sort of pull with the base is not necessarily transferable to other candidates. He has a Teflon ability, but we are seeing some of that Teflon, you know, you, you use a pot so long, you don't clean it right, the Teflon's going to come off. So is that what we are seeing now? Because there it is more questioning, especially after you look back that, you know, he cost them the House in 2018, he cost them the Senate in 2020, he cost them the Senate in 2022, and almost cost them the House that looked like a slam dunk. So you look at that, and really since he announced, it's I've almost forgotten at times that he's announced because what's he doing differently? <laughs> sort of he got out there and announced so that he could say he could. It wasn't a surprise that he was going to run run again. But, you know, he's he's essentially there in Mario Lago, not making a lot of noise, at least. And I think uh, to, you know, what Stephen and David pointed out that, um, you know, he's not on Fox News every day like he was. He, If he is, he's, you know, on more fringe conservative sites like One American News Network or something like that. Um, and to, to his great frustration, his prime rival is there in his state with with Ron DeSantis, who is who enjoyed while Republicans, you know, at least disappointed across the ballot. That did not hold true in Florida, where he he rolled to re-election. I mean, you know, I remember I was looking at the results on election night and we got Florida in pretty early. And if you had told me in the Senate that Marco Rubio was beating Val Demings, who is a very good nominee by Democrats, by 16 points, I would have said, we're looking at 54, 55 Senate seats. Um, but that obviously wasn't the case. So DeSantis has been able to build something in Florida. Is that transferable, perhaps more so than what Trump has been able to do? We have only one minute left. So um, since this is our last time together um, with the three of you in 2022, I want to ask you for a very quick Prediction for 2023, 10 seconds. Steve Clemens, prediction. Uh, you know, that's a tough question. What am I thinking about? You know, U.S.-China relations will get better than they are now. U.S.-China relations are better. So I guess no war over the Taiwan Straits. Okay, no. Jessica, your prediction. 
Democrats are going to have to make a big decision if Kirsten Sinema does decide to run. Are they going to support the Democratic nominee? Are they going to support her? That could really irk off the progressive base. And, um, you know, we've never really encountered a scenario like this. You had Joe Lieberman that ran as an independent after he lost, but Sinema is doing this preemptively. By the end of the year, Donald Trump will be indicted uh, by the Department of Justice for both um, uh, hiding secret documents at Mar-a-Lago and his role in January 6th. Okay, big predictions from David. Well, we will know at least some of these before too long. Thank you so much, Steve, Jessica, and David. Thank you. Thank happy you. holidays and a happy new year to you all. In August 1990, my wife and I moved to Yaoundé, Cameroon, for her to start the field research work for her doctoral dissertation. It was an auspicious time to arrive in the capital of that mid-sized country in West Central Africa. Just weeks before we got there, Cameroon made history by being the first African country to make it to the quarterfinals of the FIFA World Cup. In a country riven by ethnic, religious, linguistic, and tribal divisions, soccer was the national unifier. I still remember the pride every Cameroonian, Christian and Muslim, French speaker or Anglophone, felt at the remarkable success of the national team. Twelve years later, in 2002, my wife and I, now with two of our three children, moved to Rabat, Morocco, for her to serve as lead economist of the World Bank. We fell in love with the food, the colors, the music, the culture, and especially the people of that Northwest African country, and we returned many times after our idyllic two years living there. So it's with great pride as an unofficial Moroccan that I share the excitement that all Moroccans have with the success of the Atlas Lions, the first African team to reach the FIFA semifinals. Because of my wife's work, which often focused on how to bring economic development to the poorest, most remote parts of countries, and thanks to my own historical research about long lost stories in long forgotten places, we travel to corners of countries few people ever see. In Cameroon, we slept in huts with dirt floors in the far north of the country, now in the epicenter of struggle with the local variant of the Islamic State. In Morocco, we ventured deep into the empty desert in the east and southeast, never really knowing if we had mistakenly crossed the border into Algeria. But wherever we went, we saw little boys, then boys, now boys and girls, kicking a ball, which was really most likely just a tightly wound wad of old newspaper. That was all they needed to play soccer and through playing to dream of a different future. Now, of course, very, very few of those kids actually realized that alternative future. Indeed, if you scroll through the biographies of the Moroccan players, like those of many other teams, lots of them were born elsewhere. In this case, many in Europe. But for a variety of reasons, they chose to identify as Moroccans and to play for the national team. But even if it rarely leads to a happy ending, those dreams are not a mirage. They are a powerful motivation. And for Moroccans today, just as it was for Cameroonians a generation ago, the dream is something to hang on to, something to build upon. That's what futures are made of, today's dreams. Bahava Nasalu in the head, how the hill halkam in Baranamaj Dakhil Washington. In Can Ladekum, Aya is Tafsarat, O Ta'alikat, how the hill halka. While Hasatan, Bain al Bait al Abyad, will Congress al Jadid, El Levi Yusait and Alehi, El Jumhuriun. To Wasalu, Mai, Aber Twitter, Allah hashtag Inside Washington. O Rasaluni Mubasharatan, Allah. At Rob Satloff. Arakum el Asboel Mukbil, Shukran Lakum, Wat Ilalika.